Welcome to Inside Boxing Daily on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. Inside Boxing Daily is brought to you by MyBookie.ag. Make sure you go to the banner at the top of the GruelingTruth.com. Click on the banner at the top of the page. It will give you up to a $1,000 cashback bonus on your first deposit. Also, we are brought to you by the Retired Boxers Foundation. Make sure you check out the Retired Boxers Foundation on Facebook, Jackie Richardson and Alex Ramos. All right. I am your co-host for Inside Boxing Daily, Mike Goodpaster. Right now, I'd like to welcome in a man who got hit in the thigh once and continued on, Jeremiah Pricer. How you doing, Jeremiah? I'm doing pretty damn well. That uh, hit to the thigh, you know, left me with long-term damage. So now I've got a perpetual limp, but I'm good to go. My balls are intact. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you. Hmm. All right, I don't know what to say after that, so we're going to start off with yet another outstanding pay-per-view card where a bunch of guys got knocked out quick the way we figured. Uh, Let's go with Terrence Crawford. What's next for Terrence Crawford? Mm. I mean, this was a dominating performance, I thought. And Bob Mm. Arum says now Spence must fight Crawford. Um, I know you think Bob Arum's full of shit, though, when it comes to this, correct? Yeah, I do. I do. I I think he's trying to save his ass. I think because just about everybody knows that Spence versus Crawford is not going to be made anytime soon. In fact, I don't think it will probably be made until 2021. And the reason is pretty obvious. I mean, I think we all recognize that, you know, Bob Arum and Al Heyman are not particularly kind to one another. And, And a lot of this has been agitated by Bob Arum himself. I mean, he tried to get uh, Al Heyman in trouble. You know, he uh, put a lawsuit against him, alleging that he was violating the Muhammad Ali Act. Uh, he ended up losing that case, uh, and then, you know, in the public, uh, he's just, he's been trashing him time and time again. I mean, the, it it just reminds me so much of what's happening in politics today. It's a yeah, you know, these guys aren't reaching across the aisle and shaking hands. It's just you know, I'm I'm this or I'm that, and you know, then you point fingers. I mean, it's it's unfortunate, but it's something we've been dealing with in boxing for many many years. And I I think when Bob Arum, after the fight, was like, okay, well, you know, fifty fifty split, we'll do this, we'll do that. Again, he's covering ass his ass because he doesn't want to be looked at as the guy who's not coming to terms and making the deal. And it's funny because he, he talked all this shit going in about how, you know, Amir Khan would actually come to fight unlike Mikey Garcia against Spence and, and yada, yada, yada. And, um, uh, you know, he puts on a pay-per-view like this and then he still points fingers at Al Heyman. I mean, the Spence Garcia card may have not been particularly fascinating, but it was better than this one. You know, and so, again, he's just trying to cover his ass. He doesn't want to receive a lot of the blame when, when a lot of people are still crying out for, you know, why is it not happening? But the problem is it's not going to be happening that much on the PBC side, uh, you know, to me and just about everybody who understands, you know, boxing understands that Al Heyman has the leverage here. You know, Errol Spence will probably fight Sean Porter. OK, uh, I mean, we've been saying that that shit ever since Errol Spence beat Mikey Garcia. Uh, he'll probably fight Sean Porter, and then Keith Thurman will fight Manny Pacquiao, and the winner of that fight will get Errol Spence. And if Errol Spence outdoes Sean Porter, who has garnered good uh, ratings on free TV before, uh, and then he beats the winner of Thurman Pacquiao, who's going to be an, a, an even bigger draw, uh, he's going to have more leverage in the Crawford negotiations. Because you asked, who, you know, where does Terrence Crawford go from here? And, um, you know, that's a good question. I, I honestly don't know. I mean, Kel Brook has said that he would step in. I don't think a lot of people <laughs> want to see that either. No, he's just going to get a third um, broken you, you eye know? socket. He can't hang with Terrence Crawford. And the big one that would stand out is somebody we were going to talk about later. Might as well throw it in now. And that would be Danny Garcia. But as you've made the point in the past, what's the use of that? He just made a million dollars for fighting a no-hoper and Adrian mm-hmm. Granados. Yeah, and I, ju- I just don't think with what's going on, I don't see, you know, Al Heyman extending an olive branch to Bob Arum and saying, hey, you know, I'll sacrifice one of my top guys so you can build up, you know, Terrence Crawford. I mean, I suppose if you had long-term vision and, and you guys were a bit friendlier, right, because if, if Al Heyman did that, that would make Crawford a slightly bigger sell. And that, again, would generate more money in the long term when you finally – 
pitted uh, Spence and Crawford together. But I, I just don't think with as uh, at odds as they are right now, I don't think he's going to extend that sort of olive branch. Uh, so it's like, what do you have? You know, I mean, you look at the options at 147 for Crawford now. You know, we all know Bob Arum and, and just about all these guys like to keep it in house. So what's he going to do? He just Kavialauskas. I think after his dud against Ray Robinson, a lot of people aren't looking forward to that. Uh, um, you know, who else can you get? Um, uh, I don't know, man. So, I mean, I'm looking at the list of names here, and I, I honestly don't know. I mean. Uh, I mean, look at it, you know, Spence, PBC, Pacquiao now, PBC. Well, he's his own entity, but he's not he's not going back to Bob Arum. You know, Garcia, PBC, Ugas, PBC, Thurman, PBC, uh, Lipinets, PBC. You know, Vargas, I think, is PBC right now, too. Um, I, man, I don't know. Uh, David Avenesian is up there. I'm looking at box Rex rankings, by the yeah, way, just because it's Avenesian a little bit deeper. David nothing that's going to help anybody. No, no, nothing. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, Alexander Best Putin is another in-house guy. He's top rank. Uh, he's not ready for it. I mean, anybody who watched Best Best Putin's last fight knows that he's a good fighter. But again, he's he's not ready. Um, I he honestly don't know what ready. you do. And the thing is, this you can't. I, I don't imagine you move him up to junior mel- middleweight because he just made the move to welterweight within the last couple of years. That wouldn't make any sense to me. Um, and when you look at but, the top ten, I mean, the guys you didn't mention, Jamal James and Ugas. Well, I did mention Ugas, but Jamal oh, James, is, both of those guys are, yeah, both those guys are PBC. That's my point. So, this is all owned. Well, so the thing is this: Bob Arum can scream and cry all he wants, but all the cards are held by one man, and that's Al Heyman at PBC. Yeah, and exactly. And, and I got to be honest with everybody. It's not as if I want PBC to have all the cards and, you know, have the leverage. You know, I want Spence and Crawford to be the biggest fight possible. But it's just unfortunate. We got to acknowledge the politics of it all. And Crawford just doesn't have many options on his side of the field. And, and uh, Bob Arum's going to have to get awfully creative if he wants to, you know, get Crawford a bigger share, bigger share of the pie when it finally comes down to it. I mean, I suppose Crawford could go to 154 temporarily, kind of like, uh, um, you know, Pernell Whitaker did in his day. You know, he, uh, you know, he went up temporarily and got a trinket. I mean, who would he fight though? I mean, Laura, Laura's PBC, uh, Heard is PBC. <laughs> Uh, t- Tony Harrison is fighting Charlo again. Charlo is PBC. Uh, who am I? Who am I missing here? Uh, I nobody. Munguia her- is with the zone, so they're not right. getting him. He's Oscar De La Hoya's guy. Brian yeah, and Castano. Yeah, that's not happening either. I, no, I, I mean Castano's PBC not too. Not happening. Julian Williams is not happening. Selecki, Liam Smith, Austin Trout. There's nothing here, and this is the thing. People could be pissed off at Al Heyman about this, but don't think for one second, if the tables weren't turned, Bob Arum would do the same damn thing. And he would make all the money he could make because it does build this into a bigger fight. And also, the other thing is this. If they don't fight for two years and Crawford's not fighting top top competition and Errol Spence is fighting Sean Porter and Keith Thurman or Manny Pacquiao, that gives Spence a better chance to win in the end anyways to wait a year or two. Yeah, no, that's good seasoning. I mean, we're, we're talking about Porter and Thurman are, you know, legitimate top five guys. I mean, well, you know, I mean, Pacquiao's a legitimate top five guy. Exactly. So, I mean, stylistically, he's learning, he's learning a good bit from both these guys. I mean, Porter, you know, is he can box, he can brawl a little bit. He's a bit shorter, you know, he's physically strong. He, I mean, he's got a lot of seasoning under his belt as well. You know, Thurman is a versatile guy. Uh, I mean, it, it just bodes well for Spence in the long run. And I, I'm trying to think, I mean, maybe you can bring a guy up from 140. Uh, you know, I know the WBSS tournament is going on. Uh, you know, can Progre, uh, I mean, I know Progre's fight with the zone, but I, I mean, I don't know. You know, Yeah, but why got... would Progre do that right now? Well, he he wouldn't. I, I'm just trying to say yeah. if, if they I fight mean, in t- 2021. Hooker? Uh, now nah, Hook, hooker he's hookers that, that's a slaughter at 147 so i don't think it, i don't see him abandoning abandoning 140 i, I don't know what you do man uh, he's he's pretty fucked right now yeah he can fight a rematch with victor postal or postal yeah, yeah. whatever the hell his name is 
Yeah, you could. You could. Again, I, I was just entering, you know, the 140 pound guys because, uh, you know, it's an easy transition. You know, a guy like Progray is going to be a welterweight, you know, in the future anyways. But I'm trying to think. So he has the relic fight coming up. And then I think he has, you know, the the finals later this year. Yeah, probably against Josh so Taylor. I, yeah. So yeah, he's so I, booked until next year. Yeah. So in 2020, I suppose it's possible that uh, Crawford could get one of these guys. But again, I just don't see it. Uh, I mean, uh, they're. Uh, I, I assume that he's probably going to get like Aegis Kavialowskis, who's the top rated guy, it, you know, under his promotional banner at least once. Uh, but to build a big fight, I, I don't know what's going to go on. I, I'm, I'm at yeah. a loss here. So this is this is the problem with why we've had three pay-per-views all being charged $70 approximately this year. And we have had not one thing worth paying $70 to see. What we see here is guys like Shakir Stevenson, Teofilo Lopez, who are both great fighters, I think, are going to be great fighters, going to be players. But they're fighting guys that have no hope. And you've got a – and this this was the worst of the three cards. And to me, <laughs> Garcia yep. Spence could be justified as a pay-per-view fight. But Pacquiao Bo- – Bo- or Broner, I almost said Boner. Pacquiao and Broner cannot be justified as one. And this definitely can't be. I mean, Amir Khan was knocked down by Samuel Vargas not too long ago. And he took ten rounds to <laughs> finally beat Vargas – this was a fight that I don't know what, and I pay for almost every boxing pay-per-view. I didn't pay for this because I knew this was shit to begin with. And I watched the first two rounds. And the reason I stopped after that, number one, I felt bad because I illegally streamed it. And I knew that it hurt poor people in South Africa. So I stopped. But also, <laughs> what I knew was this. When I watched the first two rounds and I see Khan get knocked down in the first round, I mean, even guys like Jeff Horn took the first round from Crawford. Crawford usually does nothing. He feels them out. So if he's knocking you on your ass in the first round, you have no chance. Now, my other problem is this. I'm glad I didn't pay for it because I don't like to say that you, you'll always hear me say to anybody that says a boxer's a bum that you're an idiot. Because a boxer cannot be a bum. They just can't. Because of the courage it takes to climb in between those ropes. But what we saw was, we saw Amir Khan quit. And I've got no problem, and we talked about this off air. If he's getting his ass kicked and going into the sixth round, he just tells his trainer, man, I don't want to get hurt. I'm retiring. I'm done. I've got respect for that. That's fine. You know, he admitted that he didn't have it, and he quit. Instead, he goes out, he gets hit in the hip, and then he drops down and acts like somebody just took like a baseball bat to his groin for 10 minutes. He doesn't even take five minutes, which he's allowed. He just tapped out. I mean, and now today, he wants to make all these freaking excuses. I mean, he got his ass kicked. He was not in the same league as Terrence Crawford. He didn't belong in the same ring as Terrence Crawford, and he quit. It's plain and simple. That's what it is. He quit. Yeah, he did. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just gotten odd after that because he said, um, uh, "Hell, what did he say that?" Um, well, oh, he said he, he was doing good in the sixth round. Oh well, he he even said that. Yeah, the tides were, you know, the tide was turning, and that uh, Crawford was starting to get. Um, he was starting to huff and puff, right? Like he was acting yeah. as if <laughs> he looked uh, wore out. As if Terrence, yeah, like yeah, the tables were turning, but you know, in his favor. I mean, come on, man. I, if again, if you would have, like you said, if he would have just admitted, hey, I was outclassed. I'm a bit old. You know, I can't compete on this level anymore. People wouldn't give him much shit for it. You know, I mean, he's put, he's put in a lot of effort. The dude's, the guy has fought a lot of fights he didn't need to. You know, moving up to 160 and fighting Canelo, he didn't need to do that at all. I mean, the guy's shown that he's, he's not a pussy, you know. But in this fight, I, he I think it just— He was a pussy in this fight. It, yeah, I think it just all clicked. I think he was just like, fuck, man, I, I've been through this too many times. I don't need it anymore. And again, it's it's what I even stated in my article today. I mean, if he would have just admitted to it, just been honest, we'd have been like, OK, I, I can understand. You know, you checked out. It's still shitty. I mean, it's still shitty that he he you know, he's collecting like five million dollars from that performance. It, it's shit. Uh, you know, I mean, he still shouldn't be given out. And, and honestly, I think they should be able to hold, you know, withhold 
guys paychecks for this sort of stuff i know it's it's probably not legal but you know, it just it just sucks that guys can constantly get away with it i mean you see more efforts like that any more than i can ever recall and uh again khan's a good fighter you know i still think he's got good hand speed and his timing's okay and you know his footwork kind of sucks you know and i still i still think he compete with fringe guys but uh, they might as well just make the Kell Brook fight. I mean, I know it's well past its due date, but you can still sell some tickets and get a good payday from that. I think he should never fight again. And this all hurts boxing. We talk about the pay-per-view, but with ESPN, I think this was their first, their debut on pay-per-view. This is not good for ESPN. It hurts boxing. And <clears throat> what top-ranked boxing chose to do was match Crawford against a faded fighter in Con who has a history of being knocked out and has been largely a part-time fighter for the last five years. And that's just asking for trouble. And they played fans for suckers. And I I don't think that they got too many suckers on this. I haven't seen pay-per-view numbers on this, but I assume that it's probably didn't do that well. And I'm just proud of myself because I sat there wanting to push that button so bad. And I didn't. I watched Danny Garcia and Adrian Granados instead. And at least with Adrian Granados, Adrian Granados, and I met him at the Broner fight. He is a warrior. He's a good man. He went out there. He gave his best effort. He got his ass kicked. He never made excuses. He never quit. Danny Garcia looked good. But you know what? I wouldn't be him fleeced out of $65 from ESPN. And this shit gets old. I mean, they put crap out here, and then they wonder why nobody buys it, and they wonder why boxing's numbers are going down. It's because of crap like this. You could, If you're going to have yeah. this fight, put it on regular ESPN, showcase Crawford, lead to a bigger fight. But this is an absolute joke. This is basically saying ESPN thinks you as a boxing fan are a complete idiot. And the other way they show that is, I don't know who did this broadcast, but in the past they've shown that they think you're a complete idiot because they put, you know, what's that dumbass's name? Stephen A. Smith as an expert boxing analyst. And he's not that. He's an idiot. So basically, ESPN plays every fan for an idiot. Well, I liked it, it better when they just had Friday night fights. The fights weren't that good, but you didn't care because it didn't cost you any of your hard-earned money. Well, and to be honest with you, I mean, you know, ESPN Friday night fights turn a lot of people onto boxing, even if there were, you know, a lot of low, low-level matchups. Yeah, because I mean, every shit. once in a while you'd get a fight. And you know what? I can take watching Shakur Stevenson and Telefimo Lopez, who, who both could possibly be the future of boxing, work their way up. But I have a real problem with paying $70 for it, Jeremiah. And the other problem is this. Most people didn't pay $70. So they didn't see Lopez. They didn't see Stevenson. And you want everybody to see Lopez and Stevenson every chance they get so you can build them into an attraction you could put on pay-per-view. Yeah, no, that's why the... the, I mean... uh... Again, this isn't party lines for me. It's just the PBC model is better. I mean, this PBC on Fox, when you're getting guys on free TV, I mean, we see what happens when you pit uh, good fighters against one another. I mean, look at the the ratings Keith Thurman versus Sean Porter did. They were fucking excellent. Now we're, again, like you said, we're talking about guys that might be the future of their divisions, and, you know, they're, they're performing in front of who? You know, they're performing in front of what? I mean, it, yeah. it, it wasn't worth it. I mean, and yeah. What, I, I, made, what made Sugar Ray Leonard a household name? Sugar Ray Leonard was a household exactly. name before he even became a pro. But then right. they showed it, every fight on CBS or ABC leading up to when he finally fought Wilfred Benitez, which was on free TV. And until these guys get their heads out of their asses and realize they're killing the sport, nothing's going to change. And mainly... Not until fans get their heads out of their asses and quit supporting this kind of crap. Yeah, and and the worst part about it all to me is that you know guys like Bob Arum, they're doubling and you know, like these guys are doubling down on this on a system that sucks. I, I mean, I, I don't get it. I mean, we're we're talking about an economic model which sees boxing you know seen by fewer and fewer people, and they're just trying to milk they're just trying to milk every penny from everybody they can with this crappy system. I mean, I mean. 
you know, guys like Bob Aaron probably thought he was getting a good deal with ESPN. Who knows? In the long run, run maybe it will be, you know. But, uh, again, like the Zone and, and ESPN Plus app, you know, they're doing it for the subscriber base first. Okay, so that's what you need to acknowledge. It's not for the good of boxing. ESPN's been dealing with boxing for many, many years. If they thought the sport had long-term potential, they, they were probably invested heavily in it a long time ago, but they knew it didn't. And it, I want to go back to uh, something you mentioned a second ago about the broadcasting. I thought the broadcast team was horrible. I mean, I, I think Tim Bradley has improved. I think Andre Ward is, is thoughtful. I, I think he's fine. I don't have a problem with those two. Joe Tessitore, I've been listening to a lot, but Tessitore to me has become such a company man that I, I, I it's just, I don't know. It's almost repulsive to listen to him talk. He, he's always using these words that are not necessary. Like, you know, Lopez, fantastic performance against Tatley. I'm like, everybody, come on, man. We all knew Tatley wasn't going to provide that much. He wasn't a puncher. He was a good mover. That You know, he, he's constantly using these hyperbolic terms uh, to try and sell people on this on on nonsense, you know, he's just such a company man that it really irks me, and I, it, it just makes me miss the you know the Showtime guys who are much more moderate in their approach. And except don't have, for except, Mario Ronaldo, I'll never. Except for Ronaldo, except yeah. for Ronaldo, who's he who's sucks. a lot like that. Yes, yeah. he sucks. He calls he, boxing like it's a soccer match, and soccer is yeah. stupid, anyways. But go ahead. Yeah, I just I don't know, man. I get sick of listening to Joe Testor trying to sell me on everything. You know, call he's like Ronaldo in the sense that he. Hey, you know, did every, they have Stephen A. Smith on it? I didn't know. I don't think so. I just oh. remember I, I just remember Smith commenting afterwards about how you won't ever watch a mere con fight again. Oh, but no, man, it, it was it was just it was annoying to listen to them all talk. It's like they're constantly talking about Stevenson. You know, Bradley's like, oh, he'll whoop anybody in the division right now. And, you know, Testor's like, oh, yeah, I don't know, man. I just I don't like his approach. He's just he's such a company man now. And I actually think that's why they got rid of Teddy Atlas, because he's not a company man. You know, even if top rank was paying him money, I, I could rely on Teddy to, you know, do some of his homework and, you know, call out bullshit decisions if he saw him. But this is what we're getting. We're just getting a bunch of company men. All right. We have a comment from Scott on Twitter who says, I don't want to see Khan fight again. Give me fights worthy. Give the fights to worthy contenders instead. Um, we also have Ricardo who on Twitter says, mm -hmm. I love listening to you guys because you don't sugarcoat bullshit and act like there's multiple champions. Thank you, Ricardo. That's what we're shooting for, too. Um, Jizzy. <laughs> His name is Jizzy. He says, King Kong is finished in the sport. Crawford is screws because he's signed with the wrong promoter, and now he has no big money opponent. And that is a shame. And the thing is. is this. It used to be back in the day, and I told you about this. Leonard and Hearns. Everybody thought it would be hard to make Leonard and Hearns. And at one point, it looked like it was going to be the first time. I'm not talking about the second. But I remember, I think it was in Boxing Illustrated, where Tommy Hearns actually took out an ad in the, in the boxing magazine talking about Chicken Leonard. Now, I don't think that's why the fight got made. But those guys wanted to fight. They demanded that they fought. And they fought. And now fighters do not have the intestinal fortitude to do that. Or they just don't realize that they can do that. I yeah. mean, because when you look at it, if Errol Spence said, hey, Al Heyman, I'm not fighting again until you sign me to fight Terrence Crawford, this fight would get made. And that's what people don't understand. The power here is with the boxer. You can swing this to yourself just by saying, hey, screw it. I want to fight the best. I'm not putting up with your bullshit. I want to fight the best. Yeah. Then you and get I, that fight. Yeah, I do think it takes some marketability. I do think you have to brand build yourself enough to be independent. I mean, if, if you know, one of these lower level guys did that, like, you know, like a PVC side, like Ugas or something was like, you know, fuck you guys. I'm not fighting. <laughs> They're going to uh, say, uh, all right, don't fight. Yeah, Aaron was like, okay, but the well, thing I guess, is this, you know, I think Crawford and especially Spence with all his free TV stuff, this is a huge fight for boxing. It needs to be made, and it needs to be made for September. Yeah, and I think that I think Bob Arum's going to have to get real creative in the way that he brand builds. And you know, anybody who listens to me regularly, my my sort of opinion is that these guys need to treat 
the boxers themselves a bit more like Vince McMahon treats his wrestlers. And if there's one thing that Vince does really, really well, it's he brand builds. I mean, he builds the characters. I mean, the NFL and the ML or the NFL and the NBA are doing a great job at that far better than NHL, far better than MLB. You need to build these guys up. And and you saw it again. We're not fans of, you know, Deontay Wilder on the show, but you know, when they put him in front of almost 14 million people during the, what was it? The final four tournament, that's how you build a guy. Yeah. I mean, a lot of guys are like, who the hell is that? But I mean, you <laughs> but put then a mic they in front Google of his face, it, you find out and points. then maybe want to watch him. Exactly. I mean, maybe they just go to YouTube and watch a, um, a video. I mean, these, these things, there's correlation with these things, right? I mean, I'm, I'm sure a number of people went to YouTube, looked up highlight videos and saw them start to number of people. They're like, wow, you know, whether you're a, a hardcore fan or not, you know, these people are just like, oh, wow, he's, he's, he's got this many wins and this many knockouts. He must be pretty damn good. So Bob Arum is going to have to be, get real creative with Terrence Crawford with this kind of stuff. I mean, I know they've already done it with, uh, you know, they put Crawford in some of the NBA things and, and uh, yada, yada. I think he was in the, uh, was it the celebrity basketball game? Uh, before yeah. the all-star game, that's good stuff. I mean, but he's going to have to get real creative here because Spence is clearly got a better road towards brand building than, than Crawford does. And it sucks, man. I really think both these guys are really damn good. Crawford might turn out to be an all-time great. I mean, he, he just really looks fantastic, but uh, eventually I think it's going to get it done. I think both of these guys think that they're safe enough to eventually, you know, to where they can get it done. Right. I, I don't think they see, Spencer Crawford get knocked off at any time soon. So, again, I, I think they're going to be okay. No, I mean, the biggest risk there would be Spence just because he's going to fight to better competition. All right, Jeremiah, you want to go to On This Day? Absolutely, man. So, On This Day is the one that a lot of people are familiar with. I mean, it's Lennox Lewis get knocked off by Haseem Rockman. Um, you know, it was change, change hands of the heavyweight championship of the world. And one thing that I noticed rewatching this before I came on, you know, I had seen it before, you know, it was a big deal back then and rightfully so. I mean, Lewis was the man in the division. I mean, it was, I think it was six years on that he had been upset by Oliver McCall. He was rebuilding himself and, uh, he got a little sloppy in this one and got knocked off and, uh, you know, I was watching the fights and I was trying to see what Haseem Rockman did. Cause it, a lot of what was said was, Lewis was lazy, and you know, basically, it was it was Lewis's fault that he lost it. And I do think yeah. it, that uh, Rockman is partially fought right. A great fight, he threw a great punch. But the thing that stood out to me was this: the only reason this fight took place was that Lewis had originally hoped to meet Tyson during the summer of 2001. That fight was nixed, though, because Tyson was issued a three month suspension earlier in the year after testing positive for marijuana, or as my dad's friends used to say back in the day, those left-handed cigarettes uh, (laughs) after his 2000 fight with Andrew Golata. So he opted to make Haseem Rockman his defense. Uh, And Lewis, this ended up being, I think, I'm not 100% sure, I think it was the second biggest upset numbers-wise. You know, we get to share it and report every day, so I'm on these odds. And Lewis came into the fight as a 20-to-1 favorite. And I think, wasn't this, well, this was the fight in South South Africa, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. yeah so they, right. they also fought at like five in the morning. Maybe that was a problem. Yeah, probably, probably threw them all off. <laughs> yeah. But the question is this. How much does this damage, or how much damage does, did this fight do to Lennox Lewis's you know, his resume, because when you look at it, whenever anybody brings up Lennox Lewis, you've always got a couple of people in the couple of crackheads in the corners saying, what about McCall and Rockman? They knocked him out. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think, I mean, it's justifiable to bring it up. I mean, you got to count every, you got to count the context of wins and losses in everybody's career. Yeah. I mean, there are some that you can write off like, uh, you know, if it's a foul or, you know, there was just some weird thing going on, like, you know, like Joe Gons, for instance, you know, if you if you were like, oh, well, hey, you got knocked out, um, you know, in the 27th round against, uh, you know, Nelson or some, battling Nelson that, you know, of course, that's that's not right. I'm just making stuff up here, you know, and, and you realize that he had tuberculosis at the time. Yeah, I think you can write something like that off, you know, or or you can pat it a little bit and not give him so much stick for it. 
But, uh, I mean, yeah, like you said, Rockman had a good game plan, too. It's not – you can't just say, hey, Lennox Lewis was distracted, uh, you know, it was all him. I mean, there's a guy in there punching him in the face. You can't just say it's all Lewis. And one thing that I noticed was it seemed Rockman early on was jabbing to the body. He was trying to stay low. He was trying to get Lennox Lewis to lead. You know, he threw a few accurate counter punches here and there. Uh, but I think, you know – before the i mean this what it didn't get deep we didn't get into deep enough waters for these guys both to be really tired and uh, you know for attrition to kind of take hold it just looked like lewis got a little sloppy and didn't really take the the event as serious as he should i mean uh rockman landed partially landed a pretty good right hand i think about the minute 23 mark uh and lewis you know just smiled at him and again didn't look like he he took it all that seriously and then he you know put his back on the ropes did a, a little pivot and then got caught cleanly with a with a huge shot and he didn't look terrible as he was rising but you know the ref was there he was that was a judgment call and you know i think he he did the right thing again he he's closer to the fighter than we are this is real time you know you can so i've seen some people say oh well they should have let lewis try to get up Again, I, I trust the ref with that decision. I didn't see it as that controversial. No. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, like I, you can count it against him. I mean, the you McCall know, the... knockout, I think, was more controversial than this one was. Yeah, I, I think I, w- I would agree with that one. You know, I, the, I would... the interesting thing about this is after the fight, if you remember, Rockman kind of became an overnight sensation. And Showtime offered him an estimated $19 million to sign with and face Mike Tyson in the first defense of his newly won titles. HBO offered Rockman $17 million to face Lewis in a rematch. The problem is this. Rockman turned down both offers and instead agreed to fight Danish fighter Brian Nielsen, who, if you've ever seen Brian Nielsen... He looks like I did, like in January the 6th, which that's when I went on my plant-based diet and lost 60 pounds because I didn't want to be a fat ass with tits. That was Brian Nielsen. And he would earn $5 million for fighting Brian Nielsen. The only problem for Rockman is that fight with Nielsen fell through because Lewis had a rematch clause in his contract, and he went to court in hopes of you know gaining his rematch with Rockman and in June of that year, a judge ruled in Lewis' favor, giving him the legal right to face Rockman for the titles in August. Both sides were able to each reach an agreement. The rematch was November 17, 2001. And in that rematch, let's just say that Lennox Lewis had, you know, I seen Rockman gain Lennox Lewis' attention with that first knockout. And if you watch the second fight, that was Lewis at his best, and he just basically beat the brakes off of Haseem Rockman. Yeah, no, that was like car crash number two for Haseem Rockman. I, I like that Lennox Lewis because he came in with, a, you know, that sneer. You know, just that sneer guys like, uh, you know, Thomas Hearns used to have where he was like, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm fucking this dude up tonight. And he did. I mean, he <laughs> he beat his ass. I he mean, wrecked uh, him. <laughs> Yeah, he did. I mean, Jesus, that that left hook uh, right hand that put him away was devastating. Um, Yeah, but I mean, you know, the first fight again, you got to give Rockman credit. You know, I mean, he did throw the punch. I mean, it was an accurate shot. You you know, know, hit him. Exactly. He he hit him bang on the chin. I mean, he showed up. He he put in the preparation. Again, you can't. This is, uh, I think people get too caught up sometimes in making excuses. I mean, I, I get it, man. You know, things can go wrong, and a guy won't show up 100%. And, and to be honest with you, a lot of guys aren't 100% anyways when they go into a ring. You know, and it's funny. Whenever somebody has a loss, they're like, oh, well, you know, things weren't 100% in my life. They they never really are. You know, no. it's it's rare it's rare that you know things would be perfect and, and it go the way you want all the time i mean hell i'm no heavyweight champion of the world but you know i've got my ups and downs too you know my bumps and bruises but you, you take them you know you learn to deal with them uh but yeah it was a devastating knockout you know listening to the um the commentators in that one too man there was like some hardcore feelings of patriotism with george foreman and <laughs> there always was with george inside, george you know, is a Lampley great and, patriot uh Oh, dude, George started singing the national anthem. <laughs> that's that's what he did. He he started singing the national anthem. He was a, or no, what, no, what was it? Uh, was he singing American 
uh, no, he was singing the national anthem and he was, you could just hear how giddy he was in his voice. And, you know, Lampley was all for it and you know, all the guys were for it and they were happy about it. And one thing you got to notice is when I'm watching Twitter here. So, you know, I hop on Twitter occasionally and, um, I saw a bunch of people sharing this, you know, kind of the on this day moments as well. And a bunch of them were like, oh, well, this was also fought for the IBO title. Well, who gives a <laughs> shit about that? The International go, go listen, Body Odor Championship. Go listen to the broadcast. They didn't give a shit about any of that. Has, Lennox Lewis has said on Twitter that he didn't give a shit about the IBO title. Okay? Yeah. If you if you listen to the way they talk during the fight, they say the Lennox Lewis is the world champion. When Haseem Rockman won, they said he's the, the world's world heavyweight champion. champion. Yeah. They didn't ca- they didn't care about all that nonsense and neither should you. It's all bullshit. Yeah, and you reading into that bullshit is why we have Joshua Fury and Parker. Or Joshua Fury and you know, Wilder. All right, almost forgot Wilder. But feeding into their bullshit is why we have three guys that claim to be heavyweight champions that won't fight each other. Yeah, it's it's like uh, it's <laughs> because like John if Ar- only one was considered a champion, Jeremiah, the other two would do anything to get in a ring with that one. But since we give them these bullshit trinkets, it takes away the need for those two guys to fight each other because they can make millions fighting other guys that aren't a threat. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, like John Einhorn, Ryan, uh, yeah. John Einhorn put it well. I, I, he put it a while back on one of the shows. He said it's like a bunch of people fighting for their fiefdoms. You know, it's like a bunch of, you know, like oh, I'm the king of this castle and I'm the king of this castle and I'm the king of this castle. I mean, it's all a bunch of bullshit, man. I mean, who wants to? Yeah. Who wants to? Who wants to deal with that sort of shit? I mean, because of this, we've had all sorts of people avoid one another. I mean, look at. Uh, I mean, we could think of a million examples. Well, maybe not. Well, how about this? Oh, Until million, the but... start of this century, during the 20th century, I think it's safe to say that the heavyweight champion was considered, number one, the baddest son of a bitch on the face of the earth, and number two, the most important athlete there was. I mean, if you look back from Jack Johnson to Jack Dempsey, Joe Lewis, Rocky Murciano, Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, George Foreman, um, Larry Holmes, Evander Holyfield, Mike Tyson. When you say those names, what do you think? You think yeah, that's there's the, a connotation to that's it. That's the baddest son of a bitch there. Now, if all of a sudden I walk down the street in England and I scream, Anthony Joshua. There's going to be half the people there scream back, Tyson Fury is the real champion. And there's going to be one little dude from America who screams, Deontay Wilder is. If you don't have just one champion, why are you fighting? Yeah, well, and how much sense does it even make to claim more than one world champion? I mean, who who gets by with it? There's no other sport that does that. Yeah, you don't have regular World Series champions, <laughs> Super Bowl champions. It's all nonsense. And it's funny because, you know, the belts matter crowd. And, and again, I do understand it. I do understand how, you know, you know, bullshitting somebody and saying, hey, I'm also a world champion can help you sell more tickets, you know, to the, the casual fan who's like, it doesn't really know better. But when you have, you know, when we get into the, when you break it down and get in a definition, I mean, it just seems only right that only one person can claim it. I mean, after all, back to George Foreman, uh, what did he say? I mean, how many worlds are there? There's only one. There's only one world. So how can you have more than one world champion? So that's why, you know, I, I think it's it's best to, you know, say, hey, well, he may be an IBF champion or a WBC champion or WBA but let me let me highlight how absurd this is all going to become at one point. I mean, you may have a time when a guy actually may hold all four title belts and still might not be the world champion. It's possible for you to have a Laniel champion, a guy who actually beat his top ranked challenger and not hold any of those belts. And somebody somebody might all might hold all those belts. I mean, it might it might come a time where you actually have a lineal champion who's separated from all the belts. It's possible. And to think that it, it is, it just shows you how, how absurd all of this is. Yeah. I mean, fans are stupid. And I'm not saying everybody out there is stupid, but if you buy into this, 
you're part of the problem. I mean, this well, is yeah. something that, to me, the way I grew up, the lineal champion was Klitschko. Klitschko lost to Fury. It makes Fury a champion. Now, the problem with that is Fury was gone for more than two years when he was on his cocaine, food, and whatever else he was doing, bench and being depressed and all this horse shit. So that would make him not the champion. Now, the way that I was raised, that means the top two guys fight to see who the champion is. At that point, <clears throat> we did not have Deontay Wilder fight Anthony Joshua. And then, to make the mess even worse, Tyson Fury comes back into the picture claiming he's still the lineal champion. But, well, and, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. No, no. I mean, and that's that's an interesting point. I mean, if you if you think that uh, Tyson Fury is the lineal champion, and I, I'm not saying there's no justification in that, but we could have it at the heavyweight division. Imagine if Ty, uh, Deontay Wilder and Anthony, Anthony Joshua fought, and you know Joshua holds all the title belts, but you know Fury is the lineal champion. I mean, uh, just think about it. It could happen. Uh, you know, in the next year, next two years. I mean, it, again, it just shows you how dumb all this crap is. And again, if, if there was one guy holding all the title belts, and this is one of the things, this is one of the objections that I get from people is they're like, oh, well, if there's only one champion, uh, you know, a lot of guys aren't going to get a shot. Well, guys, a lot of guys shouldn't have a shot. So I don't know what the point is. Yeah, I mean, and the point is this. If you only had one champion, everybody would want to fight him. So if Tyson Fury was the real heavyweight champion right now, Wilder and Joshua would do anything they could to fight them. They would take less money, whatever it takes, because the only way they can call themselves the champion is to beat Tyson Fury. Yeah, and I think that's an important point. And back to what I was saying real quick is people are like, oh, well, you know, maybe Dillian White or Joseph Parker wouldn't get a shot. Well, who gives a shit, man? (laughs) Really, the sport should be really we should revise these rules. I mean, if you had, for instance, you know, this is just what I was thinking about. And if you guys think it's a shitty idea, go ahead and tell me. But I was thinking if you had a governing body and you had one champion per that champion would be obligated to fight his number one contender every year. And then maybe one other fight against a top 10. Well, wait guy. a second, Jeremiah, real quick. The problem with that is this, the mandatory contend- contender in the WBC is the number four ranked guy. Correct, but that's why I'm saying in an ideal world, you would have an independent rankings organization put this, put the rankings together, and then the number one guy would get a shot every year, and then maybe you know the champion's other fight could be uh, maybe a top ten guy, and then if you wanted a, another defense, right? If you wanted to fight three, four times, you know maybe you do top fifteen or top yeah, twenty, you right? You know, a, an easy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you could fight I'm a white short. guy everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you could fight a Tom Schwartz kind of guy. I mean, th- that's kind of my feelings on the. But, but who gives a shit if if a guy like, you know, Andy Ruiz Jr. isn't getting a shot? Not everybody deserves it. You, sh- this is the problem with it too. Is you should have to earn your shots. I mean, even when there was only two alphabet trinkets, people realized that hey, this is the number one guy, and you should get your shots. I mean. Nowadays, we're like, okay, you know, the, okay, now you get far more title defenses and far more guys who are unworthy get shots. I mean, the problem is most of the guys who are getting title shots are not worth it any, anyways. Dominic I mean, it's Brazil's going to gonna have to two shots. Exactly. I mean, who, who wants to tell me that Brazil even deserved one shot? Nobody except for Brazil. Exactly. exactly. And I mean, if you want to get right down to it, What's Deontay Wilder done to deserve a shot? <laughs> you know, Anthony Joshua's got a few wins there, but, I mean, really, none of these guys are that good. And the people that say, well, this could be like the 90s are just smoking crack because it's not. Because when I watch these guys, Joshua may get better, but I don't think he will. I mean, even at his age, I don't think with all the money he's getting, I don't think there causes a burning desire to improve. And when I watched Deontay Wilder, I mean, the dude's in his 30s. If he hadn't figured out how to throw a combination yet, he ain't going to. And Tyson Fury, he's entertaining. He's a fun guy to listen to. He has some boxing skill, but he can't punch. 
And, I mean, all three of these guys, I think, at least two of them are severely flawed. And I think the third one in Joshua is severely flawed personality-wise. So I think our biggest hope is one of these young guys to be able to come up and do it. But from watching them, um, Effie Ajagba, I think, could be it. Daniel Dubois could be it. But I don't see these guys and think, you know, in the early 80s or mid-80s, when I saw Mike Tyson the first time, I thought, man, this dude's going to be heavyweight champion. When I watched Evander Holyfield for the first time, I thought, that dude's going to be the heavyweight champion. I don't remember the last time I watched a heavyweight and thought, that guy's going to be heavyweight champion. That's been at least 20 or 30 years since that's happened for me. Yeah, I think that <clears throat> I think the most uh, the most convincing person I thought I saw was Vitaly Klitschko, but of course, you know, with Vladimir and Vitaly, you know, fighting together, it was you know kind of hard to say. But I mean, you know, Vladimir struck me as a guy who's going to reign atop because he's actually a guy who took it seriously. Uh, I mean, that's what you like to see. I mean, well, Anthony so Joshua, Vitaly, like... he had injuries that hurt him, but I mean, come on, do we really think Vladimir Klitschko? I mean, Vladimir Klitschko is a really talented guy, but he's not one of the top ten heavyweights of all time. Uh, he might be. Uh, I don't think he is. I mean, my problem is this. We saw him get knocked out by so many guys <laughs> that I, I'm not a huge Mike Tyson fan, but if you put Tyson against Vladimir, I mean, Tyson hits him, especially Tyson in his prime. He might just crack him once on the chin and it's over with because we saw that happen to Vladimir a lot. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah, and Vladimir and Vitaly to me were both really talented guys but we never really saw him fight anybody that was that good where we could make a judgment all time on them. Yeah, well, and, and I I can see your point of view there. Again, I, I don't have a definitive top 10 list at heavyweight. The reason I say maybe is because of this. I mean, there's just so much subjectivity to the heavyweight division. I mean, after Ali and Lewis, uh, you know, Holmes is up there, you know, Marciano's up there, right? There, there are a lot of guys who have talent and substance in terms of resume as well. But once you get outside the top five, well, uh, you I, know, I think you near got the this. bottom I ten. I think you've when got you look at... Ali, Lewis, um, and this is not in any order. It's just what pops to my head. Ali, yeah, yeah. Lennox Lewis, Joe Lewis, George Foreman, Joe Frazier, um, who Jack else Johnson. we got here? Jack Johnson. I'm not a big fan of Dempsey, but I guess you could throw Dempsey in there. Marciano, if I didn't throw him in there. Um, yeah, so to me, you could make a case for him top ten as long as you put him below <clears throat> those seven or eight guys. Yeah, well, and and that's my thing is it different people put different emphasis on on things, you know, because – some people, you know, put more weight on resume and, you know, quality of opposition. Some people, you know, put a little more emphasis on uh, hypothetical head-to-heads. But, yeah, it's like when you look at a lot of people's top tens, the bottom part, you you will see a guy like Sonny Liston in a lot of people's lists. And a lot of people are like, oh, well, you know, if he didn't have Ali, he would have reigned for a long time. And he would, you know, he was scary and this and that. My problem with – see, here's my thing is I think you could – put Vladimir Klitschko over Sonny Liston, who, oh, yeah. who really, you know, when, when it's, when it's all said and done, you know, Liston doesn't really have a, a great resume. I mean, and his championship run was a single title defense. So I'm saying, you know, when you put him against that, or maybe if you say, you know, I don't know if you, you like Vladimir Klitschko's longevity over Mike Tyson's. Yeah. I, I, think I, I can understand, if I can I understand it. Them, I'm going to rank him because of that longevity. You know what I mean? So I would rank him over Tyson. I don't know if he beats Tyson. I think Vitaly beats Tyson because Vitaly, I think, is going to take Tyson's power, and he was a very good boxer. The thing that is sad about Vitaly is he wasn't a few years younger, and maybe him and Lennox Lewis fought when they were in their primes. I think then we would have got a better idea of where to stand. And I think this also, when you look at the top ten, I think it's safe to say that most divisions have much better depth than the heavyweight division does. Because oh, yeah. the heavyweight division, you have guys that are up in there, like, you know, in the top 20. Most people have guys like Floyd Patterson, stuff like that. And really, we had seven or eight 
all-time greats. And after the seven or eight all-time greats, there's not a lot of depth there. There's not a lot of quality there. I mean, I could make the case from watching Jerry Quarry film. Jerry Quarry, the night he lost to Joe Frazier in his first fight, I think would beat Jack Dempsey. Yeah, I th- again, I think there's a lot of reading into it. I mean, you look at Jack Dempsey, who I, I really liked, and I mean, you look at his resume, and it's it's not sparkling. I mean, yeah, he be I don't he beat guys who were ranked contenders, but uh, you know, he took a lot of time off. You know, once he went Hollywood, he took a lot of time off, and he wasn't the killer that he was when you know he first started when he was banging the guys out in the first yeah, round. What was so, it, 1923 uh, to 27? He fought like two <clears> or three <throat> times. Yeah, I mean, he hardly fought anybody, and you know, a lot of people, a lot of people got away with it back then. You know, defending their titles sparingly, and uh, you know, it's unfortunate because now we hold it against them. I'm sure back in the day, nobody really gave a shit. They're like, oh, well, there's nobody to fight anyways. You I know, it's a bunch did. of. Uh, I bet they did. I bet they did. <clears throat> well, some some people did. I mean, a guy like Nat Fleischer, for instance. But the thing was, remember this: the heavyweight champion was the be all and mm-hmm. no in sports in the 1920s. Exactly. I mean, it was I mean, Jack Dempsey. Was Dempsey. Than Ruth. Yeah, it was Jack Dempsey, Babe Ruth, and Red Grange. Those were the three iconic figures in sports. So yeah, I mean, everybody just wanted to go around and shake Jack Dempsey's hand, anyways. But things are different now. You're supposed to fight, but they're not fighting. At least not against the people that they should be fighting against. And yeah. I, I just find it sad jeremiah because if these three would decide to fight each other it, it could do a ton for boxing even though i don't think the three are that great of fighters i think it would cause a huge stir to get a wilder joshua or joshua fury or a second wilder fury now and boxing has basically come down to this for this year canelo jacobs better be really good because the three pay-per-views people paid for they got fleeced. Hopefully yep. Canelo and Jacobs will be a good fight. Yeah, you know, and the bad thing about that is that, uh, I mean, just about, you know, most hardcore fans that I know are already like, hey, if it is a close fight, we already know who's getting the decision. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we might have a political decision taint the the win. I mean, so that's going to take the wind out of the sails too. And, and a, a guy like uh, Adam Abravitz brought up something really, really good. And I, I want to, you know, piggyback off his point, or I just want to reiterate his point. But he said that after, you know, big fights, like uh, Joshua Klitschko, for instance, there was momentum in the heavyweight division after that fight. Oh, yeah, there was momentum after Wilder Fury. And exactly. And, and what have we, what have we done with it? it? Just kill it, it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like boxing's constantly playing Russian roulette with its foot. That's That was my comment, actually. Well, but, let's look at, like, you know, 1980. Just off the top of my head, 1980. June 1980, you had Duran Leonard 1. All right? Huge fight. October of 80, Ali Holmes. November of 80, you had Leonard Duran 2. In 1981, we got, you know, Tommy Hearns against Sugar Ray Leonard. In 1982, we got Cooney and Holmes. And now we got Canelo and Jacobs, which will be followed by probably nothing. Here we are. Yeah, and it's followed by Brazil against Wilder and Fury again, or Joshua against we don't know yet. I mean, it sounds like, I don't know, I didn't hear a lot of news on this today, but I know yesterday they were saying it sounded more like Ortiz. Did you hear anything about that at all? Yeah, I mean, I've I've heard it. I, I also saw Andy Ruiz Jr. say he might be in the running too. So, <laughs> yeah, what? Did you need man. a fat ass to come in and fight for the heavyweight championship of the world? Well, you know, honestly, I mean, Ruiz is probably the you know besides Ortiz, <laughs> it's probably the best option I that they know. got. I know, and that's why it's sad. And actually, I think Andy Ruiz may have a better chance than Luis Ortiz because Ortiz is just going to get gashed, and Joshua's going to knock him out. At least that's what I think. Yeah, I don't know. I just don't see either one being that competitive. I know Ortiz is no. a classy guy. He's got a good left hand, but to me, he's just, he's just passed his best. I mean, oh he my didn't God, look... his best win was against Bryant Jennings. 
Uh, he, I mean, he's still a skilled guy. I mean, it's not often you get, you know, quality southpaws like him in the heavyweight division. I mean, I got to give him that. But the problem is he, he he just didn't look that good in his last out. I got, I mean, I did say Christian Hammer is a bit of a spoiler and, you know, he's got some smarts. And Yeah, but you know, is he this skilled of a guy or is he just a skilled heavyweight for today? No, yeah, probably the latter. But, I mean, he's still got some skill. I mean, he's got skill. Yeah, I got some skill, too. All right, we're going to go ahead and wrap the show up for tonight because I got nothing else to say. How about you, Jeremiah? That shit, I prob- I mean, I probably could, but now nah, it's, it's about an hour in now. Yeah, so but I'm starting to get good. a headache in my left eye, which means we got to quit, st- quit talking about the heavyweights. <laughs> starting to get a tick, huh? I'm starting to develop a tick thinking about it all. I don't know. Either that or I'm about to have a stroke. But if I have a stroke, well, goodbye to everybody. Um, but if I don't, we'll be back tomorrow night. Either way, Jeremiah will be back anyways, because he doesn't really like me anyhow, so he'll do the show without me. Um, all right, guys, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and wrap the show up. I'm kidding. Me and Jeremiah are like brothers. Three years, man. You know, my three-year anniversary at the Grueling Truth was, uh, it was actually a little later than I thought. I remember talking to you about it, but yeah, on LinkedIn there, said, uh, what was it, the 19th or something? I think what? it was. Three years here at the, the Grueling Truth. Yep. Oh, huh. we would have had a party if I would have known that. Shit, yeah, well, I mean, I, I didn't find out till later anyways. I mean, I, I don't ever go on there. Yeah, me neither. Maybe we should. I want to remind everybody, tomorrow at noon, me and Steve Risley will be on Survive in Advance, probably talk a little NFL draft. At 2 o'clock, Bobby Sheridan with the Sheridan Report to talk a little hockey, basketball, baseball and anything else you can bet on me and bobby will be all over it um tomorrow night me and jeremiah will be back at 11 and then wednesday at noon anthony servino will be with us from the ff Faceoff on survive in advance to talk nfl draft wednesday evening at seven o'clock joe kelly former linebacker for the cincinnati bengals will be on to talk draft cincinnati bengals style which means they're gonna screw it all up um, and then, of course, Wednesday night, Inside Boxing Daily. Thursday, Survive in Advance, once again at noon with a draft preview. And then at 7 o'clock, I believe it's 7 o'clock, on Thursday night, live on thegruelingtruth.net, we will have our annual NFL Draft Show live for four long hours. And this year, our live draft show, <laughs> it's, it's going to be live. So I was going to come up with something better, but what the hell? We will be sponsored on that draft show by Tim, Fal- F- Tim Flannery, former San Diego Padre World Series participant in 1984, and his Love Harder group, which is an anti-bullying group that gives money to combat bullying. So make sure you check that out also. And then me and Jeremiah will be back Friday night to talk a little boxing, I think. But, Jeremiah, you want to tell everybody where they can find us and like us and make comments, even if they don't like us? Everywhere. Everywhere. Well, if you don't like us, send, send that shit to my inbox, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, with your <laughs> address, because Jeremiah wants a yeah. piece of that ass. Go ahead, Jeremiah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll fucking square up, man. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> <laughs> All you got to do is fight Jeremiah in a windstorm, and you'll be fine. I've, hey, yeah. That, he I mean, felt like I, Tommy Hearns back in 1981. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Except not as uh, not as sinewy and and you know I'm not, I'm not I, I can't do the amount of push-ups he can. I got about five in me and I'm good to go. But now, nah, man, I mean, if you got some shit to say, fucking inbox me. <laughs> say yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> just say no, it. No. Go ahead, Jeremiah. No, but I, I mean, you know, <laughs> you can send me a message. But you know, in, in regards to Spotify and you know iTunes and Spreaker and Stitcher and all that, you know, give us a thumbs up, leave a comment. Again, if you, you know, you got feedback for us, or you want to hear us talk about something in particular, or you want to be on the show, you know, let us know. I mean, uh, you know, we've, we've had guys on in the past. I mean, <clears throat> not too long ago, we had a guy on to, uh, you know, debate, uh, you know, Floyd Mayweather being better than Sugar Ray Robinson. You, you know, you can check that out if you like, but yeah, just, you know, help us out. All right. Help a brother out. All right, guys, we're going to wrap it up. I want to remind you, you can hear all of our shows on iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify, 
YouTube, Zeno Radio, and I don't think I'm missing anything else other than 180 other places you can find us that I don't have time to mention. So for Jeremiah Pricer, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.